activated, visceral, whimsical. How many of you would consider yourself a people pleaser? I can see some people pleasing qualities within myself and it's all so much more clear now that I've chatted with this week's guest, Audrey Kent. Audrey is the author of The Whimsical Rebel, How to Stop Being a People Pleaser Without Being an Asshole. Audrey shares her story with us today of breaking through generational trauma to live her most authentic life as an out and proud member of the LGBTQ community who is constantly, as she refers to it, in people-pleasing recovery mode. In this episode, you'll learn that there are different types of people pleasers. Tune in to find out which type of people pleaser you are. Folks, it's time to ask yourself, what do I want? And stop pleasing everyone else. Audrey is here to inspire us with her own personal brave journey. Before we start the episode, I want to give a shout out to Malik from Inductor of Healing. If you've been following along on social media, then you might know that I've been experiencing some tremendous back pain lately. Malik has helped me in so many ways over the last week, and I just wanted to give him a little extra love. He's also the man who fixed my frozen shoulder a couple of years ago, so I am greatly indebted to him. If you are experiencing any pain and you can get yourself to Forest Park, Illinois, check out Inductor of Healing right away. You'll be glad you did. I also want to take a moment to share a new podcast with you. Fighting for Ukraine is a short daily podcast brought to you by podcast producer Stevie Manns. Each episode is less than five minutes, and it features Yuri Mastrosky, a Ukrainian journalist turned civilian fighter against the Russian invasion on the democratic country of Ukraine. In this podcast, Yuri brings daily updates from the front line of the Ukrainian resistance. Here's a little clip of the show. We urge you to listen, learn, and do what you can for the people of Ukraine. Only two weeks ago, I was a journalist. I had my own daily radio show. I wrote articles for the news sites and stood before camera at the TV news programs. As a reporter, I traveled around the globe with my helmet, bulletproof vest, and a microphone. Syria, Iraq, Gaza Strip. But now hard times came to me and made my beautiful country a bad place. At 24th of January, I woke up at 5 in the morning because of the blasts all around. It was Russian rockets targeting Kiev, destroying the buildings and killing the innocent people. The unprovoked and undeclared war began in such a way. This day was the hardest in my life. So I took my reporter helmet and went to enlist in the army and get the gun to protect the homeland. This podcast is the only thread that binds together two parts of my life, the journalists and the soldiers' ones. And I hope I can make new episodes on a daily basis till the victory day. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Hey, folks. Uh, You all know that I'm the girl who wrote a book called Fuck Fearless. I love curse words and I love being blunt but kind. Honesty is always the way to go and I'm really in love with keeping it real. So it should come as no surprise that I freaking love today's guest. (laughs) Audrey Kent calls herself a people-pleasing addict who has spent her entire life seeking the affection and attention of others while also believing that she should never actually go after whatever she wants because it might upset somebody else. Audrey's new book, The Whimsical Rebel, is about breaking your people-pleasing habit without being an asshole. She's a talented, world-traveled musician. Her approach to calling ourselves out on our bullshit is quite endearing. 
with a magical way of making you feel seen and called out at the very same time. That's a real gift, Audrey. Lots to <laughs> unpack here. I'm super excited to welcome you to the Brave Files. Hey, Audrey. Hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm wonderful. Hearing someone talk about me like that. How could I not be wonderful? <laughs> it's super awkward, right? You're like, oh. <laughs> but I I took your bio and I put my spin on it because um, I know you kind of. You've, you've done a training in my coaching group and we've had a couple of other conversations and I've read your awesome book. So I'm like, well, I'll take her bio and I'll put my spin on yeah. it. So at least it was different. I, when I hear people read what I wrote, I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, like, oh damn. damn, yeah. It's so great too because it's uh, it's it's almost like I'm hearing you talk about someone else, um, especially even though I'm a self proclaimed people pleasing addict. To hear someone say, like, ah, oh, she's this people pleasing addict who spent her whole life, blah blah blah. I'm mm -hmm. like, no, that's what? That's not me. And I'm like, oh shit. Yep. <laughs> That is. Yeah. 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 That's me. Uh, you though are, you're kind of on the other side of that. You're at least on the side of awareness of your behaviors on that. <laughs> so that there's less people pleasing on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's how you ended up writing this really fun book. Exactly. Yeah. And even, yeah. even after the book, I'm on, I'm in that, that really fun place where you're like, okay, I figured it all out. And then consistently, <laughs> My fiance is like, when I'm in a spiral, my fiance just goes, yeah, it's, it's almost like you wrote a book about it. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> so I still have to be reminded of my awareness, but it's there. <laughs> it's terrible when they throw that shit right back in your face. You're like, come on now. This is what supposed to be a loving you? situation. <laughs> You are not supposed to do that. <laughs> but you have such a fun, new, fresh approach to or people pleasing is a thing we've talked about a lot. Or and I know it's not exactly the same, but there's an overlap. Perfectionism is such a deep mm -hmm. piece of that. How did you end up in this space doing this type of work? Uh I ended up here. It's so funny because I was doing all the things, right? All the things for other people. Uh, and that included even things that felt like they were for me, like career choices or career paths mm. or things like that. Really, they were for a societal view of my life. So still still for all these other people. And in the midst of a handful of different career paths, my little bunny ears. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can see it and y'all can't. Sorry about yeah. that. You don't have to imagine. <laughs> um it's my little mocking, totally thought I was an adult with my shit together fingers. <laughs> uh, I was stumbling into the subtleties of the awareness of, oh, I'm I'm not fucking happy. Those mm. those creeping up anxieties in the body of like, but I'm doing I'm doing all the things. I'm doing all the steps. I have all these daily practices and and my life is amazing, but I'm fuck, I'm unhappy. Mm. And then starting mm -hmm. to see uh, all of the ways where I was just piping out all of this energy toward other people and not actually getting satisfaction. So really just those moments of getting cripplingly honest with myself. And then when I was like, okay, this is my problem. This people pleasing, <laughs> this codependency, why isn't this being looked at as a behavioral addiction? If maybe if I look at it like that and I treat it the way people are told to treat other behavioral addictions, like, you know, uh, gambling addiction, sex addiction, shopping addiction, food addiction, right. all these things, then maybe I can help myself. And I couldn't find that help anywhere. So then I created this methodology. And then I was like, oh, that means I'm supposed to be a coach. And that means I'm supposed <laughs> to have a coaching business and do podcasts and do all the things and sell massive packages. And, and so then my network marketing days just came like, oh. bleh, like on the back of oh. my coaching business. And so, I was, so it was this interesting there wasn't this like brick wall moment. It was like this crawling through this mud, mm. still wearing these weights of like, oh no, this is it. And it's like, okay, yeah. Like my guides up there are like, you're, you're getting closer, but <laughs> still just, uh, you know, uh, and then it really came, really came to that brick wall moment where I was standing on the edge of it. And that's when I decided to release the book with no strings attached. 
because even when I started putting my methodology into the book, it was this, oh, the book is the next step in my coaching business, right? I need to create this product to have another mm. funnel to do these things. And then I was just had was standing on this brick wall in my mind. And I was like, oh, actually, I just want to put this methodology in this book so it can just be out there and yeah. I can stop forcing myself to do what I think I'm supposed to be doing just because I have this to yeah. help people and I can stop pushing it into all these little boxes when it doesn't need to be. So, yeah. So it's interesting. People are like, is this your calling? And I'm like, I don't know, but I made a book and I hope you like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fascinating to me. This idea that w- one would write a self-help book, a personal development book, and then just be like, and now, now, so the, <laughs> the coach in me, <laughs> wants to say okay all right fine like it can stand on its own it does stand on its own like that's fine but also what are you are you afraid of doing something else with it Mm, that's and that's such a fair question right and I'm it's one of those things where I had to put down the idea that I was supposed to do anything that was already understood about what you're supposed to do with the book. Mm, Now that I like, you know, um, I'm still so excited to do things with it, but in that space of, of art, I've come at this point in my life, I've come to realize that my calling is to take everything I am going through. I'm hurting through. I'm learning through and create art with it whether that's writing, music, or whatever, and release it into the world in whatever way it wants to be with no strings attached. And then I get to interact with it as art. And then I get to answer opportunities as art, you know? And it's even the same with my music. People are like, oh, well, you're making an album. Are you going to go on tour? And I'm like, that sounds fucking exhausting. (laughs) Let's just make the album. We just <laughs> yeah. do the one thing. And then- but I want to do the album. And if someone were to come to me and be like, hey, we have this opportunity and it felt good, then yes, yeah. great. You know? So, yeah. So I'm excited to do so many more things with this book. Just not the way anyone wants to tell me I should. <laughs> yeah. I feel that. I can't wait to see what you do. As somebody who also, it, right around the same time your book came out, my book came out. Yeah. And... um it's so much fucking work to create, to birth and then promote and put out there. The idea of doing all of that and then not wanting it to help me do something else like makes me want to just go back to bed. (laughs) Uh Yeah, that is, that's (laughs) fucking fair. Yeah. And I think that really has, uh, there's different um, people have all these different styles and different, even different attachments to the things that they create and that they birth. And I am very much, and I don't know if it's just the, the flippant artist in me, but I'm very much before the book was actually the, before the actual published date, I was like, fucking done onto the (laughs) next thing. Don't want to hear another second of my voice in this audio book. Don't want to read another fucking page. Great. Hope people like it. I'm excited about the next thing, you know? Um, and as long as the first thing isn't still continually pushed down my throat, then I can still be in love with it, you know, and I can do podcasts about it. Yeah, no, it's cool. And I'm obviously not trying to give you shit about it. It's just a kind of a fascinating thing to uncover. But I really appreciate like you can create this thing and a book of any sort, a novel, fiction, nonfiction, self-help, whatever is art you can create this art that can exist for the sake of existing and you can be proud. And this is certainly how I was about the sales of my book. Like yeah. it doesn't matter. Yes. I want everyone to fucking buy it and then buy a copy for everyone else, you know, and I want to be on the New York Times bestselling <laughs> list, but really I've already done the thing. Like that would be awesome, but that's another thing that I could do. It's not the thing. The thing was writing the book and putting it out. Yeah. 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 Um, All right. So let's talk about you and people pleasing and your life. Sorry. That was not. (laughs) That was good. (laughs) I think it was good for listeners because we, 
you know, the whole purpose of this show is what does it mean to choose bravely every day in a unique way? And I deeply believe that your choice to say, I'm going to do this because I want to do this and not because it's a stepping stone, but just because I want to, that's brave as fuck because we don't do that. <laughs> Thank you. In life. <laughs> you know, yeah. I don't know. Does it feel brave to you? Yeah, it absolutely did. Especially when in the face of um, society telling you that's not how or why you write a book. Right. You know, it's like, it uh, feels a little bit more sincere to be fair. When I know leaders, professionals, business folks, coaches, whatever we want to call us, them mm -hmm. that only write a book because they want to get more business out of it. You can yeah. tell, and it feels very, very insincere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't do that. My book is part memoir. Like it was, it, it, felt like it had to come out of me. And I'm like, yeah. well, if it's going to come out, I should use it. That's fine. <laughs> Might as well write it down. <laughs> Might as well write it down. Yeah, there's um, even uh, in the opening uh, of my book, there was even, or as I was recording the audiobook, I was coming to terms with what the book actually meant to me. And then in the opening of the book, there is this whole portion talking about my coaching business. And I was like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like, you do. Like, yeah. As I was recording it, I was like, shit. I've already made this decision in me, this completely activated, like, oh, we're done decision to not run a coaching business anymore because it wasn't aligned with me. And now I'm recording this part in the audiobook, and like all these trains are moving this direction. And, you know, I was just like, that's fine. It's fine. I don't know, though, man. <laughs> I can see you doing some really cool things up here. <laughs> Fun, like whatever feels like an intuitive hit, but um, singer songwriter workshops about letting go of people please like I could see all sorts of fun things not that you need to create yeah. that from this and from your methodology but there are yeah. so many unique There's so ways to embrace stuff. it so much fun stuff yeah yeah well before we get into the methodology which I do want you to share with everyone let's just talk a little bit about you and your past uh, mm -hmm. and your past with people pleasing and with your family um tell us a little bit about as you as you have reflected, what are those moments in your life that really spoke to you and you're like, oh, these are things that were a problem that I don't want anymore? Yeah, there were, uh, there's a few that absolutely stand out, uh, like a big old kick in the dick, like just <laughs> like, can't even pretend to be like, hmm, let me think about that for a minute. Uh, my, not my father's death in particular he passed when i was 16 uh and the i'm moment sorry of his death anyway, oh thank you uh sucks. the moment of his death wasn't the thing that kind of shook me into seeing people pleasing patterns it was that whole bubble of time immediately after and watching how my family interacted uh and how people interacted with us and starting to see with him gone, oh, these gross, 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 toxic patterns and these things, uh, like suddenly seeing how the culture I was brought up in, how we communicated and interacted with others, seeing it with some shame and some like, oh, ew, you know? Well, so how did you communicate and interact with others that then felt shameful? Yeah, uh, my my mother raised us in this, uh, and it was perpetuated by uh, her mother and and so on and so on. But there was this, How it goes. Uh, yeah, right, that <laughs> generational trauma. Uh, there was this this light yourself on fire to keep mm. the world warm before you even ask if they're fucking cold. You know, that's my favorite thing about about your work and your Just book. Jump in. Jump in because you see something that makes you uncomfortable and fix it, fix it, fix it. And then demand, demand nothing in return. You know, make sure you now stay see, on the top of that totem pole. My people pleasing mom demanded lots in return. And I, I love you, mom, if you're listening. <laughs> um, I don't know that she knew she was demanding a lot in return. Mm. What she demanded was praise and it was never good enough. Yes. 
I literally to the point where I can remember multiple times hearing, I don't think you appreciate enough how hard I work to do this for you. Like, then don't fucking do it for me. Yeah. If I can't appreciate it enough, (laughs) I would rather you not do it for me. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I don't think you appreciate that I never fucking asked for it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So your mom would demand that, you know, because that's the martyr, right? No, no, no. I don't need anything back. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah, This, uh, and this, you know, it'll only get right. get done right. If I do it myself. And then, uh, basically we, we were, we were this family that would come to everyone's rescue and being raised in it. That's really how I saw it, you know, cause I didn't know if someone had asked for it. I just knew my mom was like, we're going to their house. They just lost, uh, their father. We're going to their house. We're cleaning, we're making dinners. We're helping plan the funeral. We're doing all these things because that's what you do. You know, you come and you help. And so it didn't seem weird growing up because I was like yeah, yeah like you help it's community and all these things and I mean and, and it is right my, yeah. my mom used to always say you're not really helping me if you have to ask me how to help me you're only helping me if you just help <laughs> if I have to stop and tell you what to make for dinner I don't need you to make me dinner right I feel like there's a, these are interesting things to, yeah. to balance yeah and they're and they're so nuanced and it's not you know, obviously it's not, I'm not saying that going and helping people without being asked is, is wrong or anything like that, but because it seemed like such a normal thing yeah. in that spectrum of, well, we're able to help. Why wouldn't we help? So it was this, basically it was all of the toxic traits in it. were hiding in a perfectly normal mm-hmm. caregiving bubble that if the toxic things don't exist, yes, it's a beautiful act and it's appreciated <laughs> by all. It didn't drain anyone. It's great. But if all of those things do exist inside and then you're not old enough or wise enough to see them. And then yeah. as, as you're growing up, you start to pick up on them and, yeah. and you start to, you know, you start to pay attention to what your mom is like behind closed doors after the big gesture. And you start to pay attention to how unappreciated she felt or, yeah, and then de- you start depleted asking, and exhausted and underappreciated. And yeah. And then you start asking yourself like, well, I, wow, I just, I just watched her be like, no, no, it's my pleasure. No, uh, uh, you know, all the things. Lies. And now she's, and now she's so bitter about something or she's so upset about, you know? And so it's kind of, uh, mm. it just came trickling, just trickling in. And then once my dad died, I was like, holy shit. <laughs> and even then, even though it was so, I was, I was also 16, very angsty. Oh, so yeah, even though I was hit with this, like, well, I'm not going to be like my family. Fuck that. They're all fucked. I still did all of the things like someone handed me a, a how to be just like your mom. I still did all of the things uh, in my life that perpetuated, perpetuated it. Cause at that point I still didn't understand what it was, uh, how deeply it's tied into our survival mechanisms. Yes. And so I, mean, I didn't know. And generationally, I really believe that has a play on it. So when you, I don't know how old your mom is, but she's probably somewhere near my parents' age, mid to late 60s-ish. Uh, she is, she was born in 66 and I am fucking awful at math. So, so 50... Yes. She's a little bit younger than my mom, but um, uh, my mom is a, is, is a textbook people pleaser. And we had a conversation with her a couple of years ago. It just hurts me for her because she's constantly disappointed. No one can Mm -hmm. ever give back the way that she gives and her, her, she's hurting all the time. And I want to say just like, well, then just don't, because it's okay if you don't. Yeah. And you know, her life experience, she said, I had to, from my earliest memory, anticipate what someone else would need and give it to them before they beat me, yeah. before they were very, very angry at me. And I don't know how to not do that. Yeah. Because it's the only way I know how to survive. So when you said survival, but generationally, we are not that bad. And hopefully our kids, you know, like. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and mine, it was, there was, there's of course, uh, layers of, uh, when you have parents and caregivers that 
aren't addressing their own underlying issues, there's going to be that layer of uh, learning how to hide, learning how to preemptively anticipate, learning how to be intuitive around your parents and all of those things. But yeah, for, for me growing up, it was more of watching her do it. And, yeah. and being told from go all of her padded excuses around doing it. So believing that, you know, it's, it's no different than being raised really thickly in a religion yes. and you just, it yeah. takes a certain, takes a certain stumbling onto a, wait, but this doesn't feel healthy for you to start questioning the depth of it or the realism of it. Yeah. I mean, the self-awareness required to see it from the outside is something that I couldn't, be, I couldn't say is only new to, you're not, you're younger than me. You're not even, I'm a Gen Xer. I'm a hard Gen Xer and you're. I am right on the cusp. Clearly <laughs> not, but that is okay. Um, but I feel more often than not, it's just not an awareness that previous generations had for whatever reason, yeah. for survival, for, you know, there was war, there was whatever. And it was like, just fucking do the thing, man. And we can't spend any time thinking about why we're doing the thing or how we want to do the thing differently. And now we're like, whoa, hold on. Yeah. yeah. So um, you, you've you identified these things and you didn't want this. You're like, I'm, I, nope, I don't want this. I'm going to, I'm going to choose differently than this. How did you end up with, and then can you share your particular methodology for people pleasing and then how to not fall into <laughs> to those traps. Uh, yeah. I, I actually, it would, it would be so cool if included in my methodology was how to not fall into it. But the methodology really is just how to climb out of it. Fair once enough. You... <laughs> That's fair. But once you climb out of it, then you have tools to not as often fall into it. Right. To recognize and to be like, yeah. oh, oop, dip up my toe back in. Gross. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, yeah, because it's such a, like, I think like any behavioral addiction, it comes creeping in and it's padded in those yes. societally normal, comforting mm. excuses. Uh, and even coming out of it, uh, even while I was first writing the book, even while when I first wrote the "What kind of people pleaser are you?" quiz, and I and I ran a little Facebook group to be like, "Hey, maybe people identify with this too. Maybe I'm onto something." Uh, even then, I was still living this super internally stressful, uh, unaligned life. You know, yeah. digging my heels and making things work, making a making. long-term relationship work. Bunny earring again here, making right. things work. Yeah. Making it work. Um, uh, you know, ignoring my sexuality, making a relationship work, uh, digging into a career that like who gives two shits and making it work, making it work. And uh, even coming out of, you know, coming out of my marriage, there was a, there was a long trail of just toxic, um, desperate jumping because I was, mm. didn't know I was running from this thing. And I didn't know I was running from fucking ask yourself what you want. Stop assuming what other people want and doing that and just ask yourself what you want. And I was just do, making all of these, I mean, not horrific decisions, but not great ones and definitely not healthy ones. And then digging down and making those work. So the methodology came from just listening to little inklings, right? Just just listening to like, oh, okay, I feel pretty locked down around how I'm feeling, but there is this one thread. So I'm just going to pull at that one and, and try to figure that out. And the thread started creeping in with, I found myself complaining and being a an asshole, like my mom would call it. <laughs> uh, you know, you ask for advice and then you're like, no, that won't work. Like, and I found myself sounding like the most exhausting spiraling version of my mom and my grandmother and my grandmother's mother. And, you know, and I just sounded so familiar to people that I felt so bad for. And I was like, why is that? 
I'm not like them. Why, why am I sounding like them? I look at them when they complain like this and I'm like, fuck, you are not living life. You're making it so hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. Holy crap. Like I just want to shake them. So then I just had to start kind of shaking myself around and then just following just one little thread at a time, following it, following it. And then things just started unfolding and uh, it really, (laughs) it started unfolding really well when I recognized that there were the different types of people pleasers. Cause I told myself for a long time, well, I'm not one and I'm not Mm. codependent and I'm not going to make the choices to bury myself the way my mom has, because we're not the same. And turns out, no, we suffer from the very same thing. It's just that we're at different places on the spectrum of it. And we have different excuses. Our fear has written different, differently worded excuses to pad the narrative, but it's the same narrative. You know, mine was always like, I don't give a fuck what people think about me. Couldn't possibly Mm. be a people pleaser. And hers was no one can ever do anything right. I'm just going to have to do it all, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I was like, no, we're not the same. We're not the same. No, we are. (laughs) We are. Yeah. So you have identified three different types of people pleasers, although you're quick to say it's a spectrum. There's a slide. You (laughs) you could be in the middle. Will you share the three types in there? overarching you just did two of them but we can fully yeah yeah. absolutely so I chose to give them cute little animal names because you know (laughs) makes people feel better about feeling bad but there's the mouse and that's on the far one of the far ends of the spectrum the mouse being the stereotypical the type of people pleaser codependent that you can readily find uh resources for um the the yes man the the they call you know uh, what's the term now um, like recovering doormat syndrome um, even uh, uh, narcissistic abuse victims so there's that end of the spectrum and it's this uh, they know it doesn't feel good but it's kind of like this well it's all I'm worth and it's what I was born to do Oof. I'm supposed to take care of people no it's really fine it's really fine. Um, and it's this genuine, like, no, you're right, you know, kind of beaten down puppy. And then toward the middle of the spectrum is the pit bull. And it is this, like, seems real tough, will fight whoever they're supposed to fight if they're made to, but really just wants all the affection. <laughs> and it's what it's what sustains their life force is that feeling needed, feeling like they're protecting something and then getting the love for it. Uh However, the people that they deem worthy of that loyalty can just beat the living shit out of them Mm. and they'll stay because that's their person. And for those, full disclosure, when I took the quiz, I was a pit bull, although I think there's somewhere in between pit bull and the next one you're going to share, which is Phoenix. (laughs) We'll see. Uh, But when you talk about it being a bit of a spectrum, I think of for myself, there are some people where I absolutely will not stay. Uh, I did maybe at one point in my life and I have learned now, like, no, we won't do that. And then there are other people, let's say, you know, like our children Mm -hmm. where we go, yeah, yeah, I'm going to stay. Sure. You can beat the shit out of me all the time and it'll be okay. Yeah. Because you're the person that I've chosen deserves my loyalty. Everybody deserves my, like I am a deeply loyal. I have there. I did uh, a sacred branding session with a guy who I had on the show several months ago. His name is Mike Iamelli. And there are six words that, that we identified after spending four hours together that like most represent me. And one Mm -hmm. of those words is loyal, but he said, all of them have light sides and dark sides loyal to a fault. Yeah. Loyal. To, like it's, it's super hard to do anything that I could ever feel is unloyal. Yep. Especially mm-hmm. if you're the one benefiting from that, you know, deemed to be unloyal choice, then it's like, well, that's not even an option. <laughs> like, right. It's so yeah. fascinating. All right. Okay. So there's yeah. a, you know, yeah. there's no, this is not cut and dry work. Exactly. And that's why the pit bull was so, it took me so long to accept the fact that I was, uh, like a crippled codependent people pleaser because I was like, no, I could give two shits what people think. 
And then I had to acknowledge what I was doing for the people that I deemed worthy that on my faux value system, I put above me and everyone else. I just put below me. So it was easy, you know, (laughs) that's what, um, and for the Phoenix, which is the third type, the Phoenix being the mythical creature that just poof goes up in flame and then is reborn from the ashes. Uh, and it's this really, this really beautiful, um, strong storyline. And it's that storyline really, uh, it really is distinguished. And it's the thing that Phoenixes hold tight to. Because they're like, no, the, the things I'm doing are distinguished. What mm. I do is so fucking important. And being this martyr is, this is what life is about. Because I'm the only one strong enough to do it. And it's just Ooh. like this, uh, it's, it's such an easy, because it is such a beautiful, distinguished story, it's so easy to hold tight to. And it's so easy to, just like for the Pitbull, being like a ride or die that's so easy to like yeah. hold, like dig your teeth into. Yes. Um, and as far as uh, on the spectrum, also following it is the intensity and the ability to cut people out. Uh, mice find it almost impossible. Like there's not a soul that they could actually cut out. They might hide from some people for a little while, but like cutting them out is not an option. Pit bulls, uh, it takes them a while. And then when they cut people out, they're like, got to All go. Right. Gave you a thousand <laughs> chances and fuck you, you yeah. know, and then fuck everyone, you know, um, <laughs> it's like that, that TikTok. Song. Are you on TikTok? Yeah. A, B, you C, and your mom D, and your mom. Yeah. And everyone except your dog, interestingly enough. Right. Give me your dog. Fuck you. Give me your dog. And then Phoenix it's it's a second nature cutting people off it is it even the cutting people off even becomes a a resource for any kind of discomfort you know where the pitbull reserves it for like no you actually cannot be in my life because now i can't hide from how toxic you are the phoenix might be like you asked me to look at myself too closely we're done yeah you know and yeah so it, it makes sense what you were saying about like feeling like you're in the middle but then there were those people that you were just like, no, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm wondering if, if the audience, if you listeners are, are experiencing what I'm experiencing right now, which is literally, there is like this Rolodex of people in my <laughs> head right now, as you talk about it, where I'm like, that one, oh, they'll fall there. And this one's here. And that one's a Phoenix. And this one's a pit bull. And that <laughs> one's a mouse. And like, and, 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 in this relationship, I was a mouse. And in that yeah. relationship, I was a phoenix. And in this, re- you know. Yeah. Because absolutely. just like sexuality, this shit is all fluid. So fluid. Yeah. Um, yeah. What What has identifying this, declaring it, packaging it up in your cute little book, which is cute, by the way, because it's funny and charming. And uh, I don't mean that patronizingly. It's really, no, it's just really take cute. Um, and putting it out into the world. How has that changed you? Yeah, the it changed me so hard and so fast that while I was writing the book, so I already had the methodology. I had run it. I had run a few programs, you know, in my coaching business. I was like, oh, so easy. I'll just put the methodology in a book. It's already written out. It'll be fine. I'll put some some quirky stories of my life in there, some stories of my clients in there. And what in the middle of writing the book, I I will say chose because it was a choice to blow up my life. <laughs> but uh, I fell into this. Um, there was this pit out of nowhere. I was like running through a field, like my life is great. I'm going to put the, put this easy book together. It'll be fine. And then bam, broke both my legs. And I was like, hmm, how am I going to climb out of this? Can't look away from this. And this was my sexuality. Because I was, was like, like she, she didn't really break her legs, folks. That's no, no. Not, <laughs> that's a metaphorical leg breaking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it was this, yeah, you've, you've really actually looked at so many other things. 
And now here's something that you haven't. And it was just getting bigger and bigger. And there's even a story in the book about this feeling and this felt like this monster tracking me down of recognizing and coming to terms with and coming out in my sexuality. And it happened in the middle of writing the book. And I had to, the book was slated to come out in early 2020 and I had to stop everything. Wow. And I was like, Hey, you know, I talked to my, uh, my book writing mentor and my, uh, the people I was talking to around publishing at the time and my editor. And I was like, um, hard pause. We're going to be putting some different stories in here. I'll get back to you. And then went, went fucking through it, went wow. through it. Uh, and it, you know, I was sitting at the kitchen counter with a man that I'd been in a relationship with for 11 years. And, and you do talk about him in the book. I do. Yeah. Yeah. And in the book, there's even stories of him while we were together. Mm -hmm. And uh, because yeah, that's, I wasn't with him for 11 years because I wasn't in love with him, you know, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And then there's just this moment, which was singularly, if I think about brave, the bravest thing I've ever done in my life was sitting at that kitchen counter and saying out of the blue for him, I think I might be gay. Like those six words, I almost passed out. It was so hard to get them out. Yeah. Just, and then for sure, almost threw up. Um, And then everything that came after was just a whirlwind. But that I've done so many things that could seem brave to other people in my life. And like, I'll acknowledge them as hard, but if I was, excited about them or if I was the only um, potential collateral in them it, it they were easy in comparison you know those six words that took bravery for sure yeah and so that was I really felt like that was the well, it was like it was like I'm you're not allowed to release this book until you actually do this thing because yeah. this is the thing that your codependency and not asking yourself what you really want. This is the thing. And if you keep hiding in this shadow and release this book, you are so full of shit. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally feel every bit of that completely because the ultimate people pleasing is staying in the closet to ourselves and to everyone else Mm -hmm. because we might not like ourselves. Someone else might not like us. It's going to be hard. It's going to be scary. People won't get it. Um, but that kind of, that kind of conversation is fucking hard, man. I have done that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so interesting. And everyone's experience is so different. Um, at, but still so, uh, shameful to themselves and impactful. Um, mine was, was never even, I, I was so lucky to not have, um, have had to f- fight with any uh religious trauma or uh yeah, cultural trauma or yeah. upbringing um and so it was never even a thought in my mind of if whether or not people would accept me or whether or not they'd get it i had actually been told since i was a child that i had like super dyke energy and <laughs> when i got engaged my own mother was like, I always thought you'd end up with Tammy. Like just, you know, all, everyone always thought, you know, um, and I've always been that friend to my friends, that really romantic friend that just knows how to fix things in their house. <laughs> Such a good stereotypical lesbian. I, I don't know if you t- identify with that word or not, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, it, so it was, and it was just, I thought surely this will be easier because it's not something surprising that I'm having to deal with, but it wasn't any easier because it was all the grieving of, wow, I've pushed this away so hard, even though society was like, and everyone you love was like, it's fine. Isn't that fascinating? Go for it. Why do you think that is? Why do you think you push it away so hard when you were in such a loving, affirming community or situation? Yeah. Yeah. It was because of the codependency and people pleasing addiction. It was, I watched my mother who was fiercely 
uh, independent in a way, very strong, super awesome woman. But I watched her just bow down to the male gaze and prioritize being wanted by the men in her life. Did you hear things like, um, if they're looking at you like that and it makes you uncomfortable, it's just because they like you. Oh, I, I heard things like, Uh, Oh, maybe he's he's not your type, but he really likes you. Just give him a chance. mm. Shit like that. You know, where it's just like, Oh, okay. And just, you know, so I, uh, would form these connections. Um, just like the the boy that I married when I was sixteen, uh, was was just oh this is my you best were, friend when you were sixteen yeah absolutely yeah my whole family was married very young, uh, and it was just no one questioned it it was just like yeah they all said it was a mistake, <laughs> but then they would encourage it. That's um, a baby though. I mean I yeah. I have a seventeen year old and a fifteen year old. I, I it's a baby. Yeah, it's a fucking child marriage for sure. And it was what, encouraged. Can I ask where, was, where you were living in the in, world? In, in Georgia. <laughs> I'm like, mm. <laughs> and this was, you said it was a child marriage. I mean, because it yeah. was, but it was, you, you, you chose it or you thought yeah. you were choosing it. Yeah. I thought I was choosing it. Um, I, it was incredibly encouraged. Uh, it was even suggested by my mother and she was, you know, she was going through it. She was going through her own shit. She was, she had just lost, just lost her husband. And she was, I think in that point of grief and denial where you're just trying to make sense of your own life. And so why wouldn't she encourage me to do all the things that she did and to help pad that romantic view of what her life was. And so it was just, it was just a, a manifestation of, um, the flare up in the generational trauma that was occurring in that bubble that happened right after my dad died. And I was like, I was 16 and super high. I so mean, I was I'm, like, sure. I, <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm floored and I, I, I am not judging your mom. It's going to totally sound like I'm judging oh, your mom, but as a you mom, you totally four, can. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine. Yeah. And you were like, I, this is not, you can, we can strike this. If you don't want to keep it, you can be like, no, were you pregnant? No, Who? not at why? all. Why? Not that exactly. that would be okay either. I don't think right. that would be okay <laughs> either. Yeah. But like, just like, like, oh, let this guy love you. Like what? Why? Yeah, it was. And that's, and it's one of those things where, and especially growing, it took me well over a decade, maybe even two to recognize that it was that it was shocking neglect and that it was incredibly um, yes, selfish, you know, I, but I still see it. I, I went through a lot of anger around that. Uh, but then I still am able to look at it now of like, right, it was neglect. It was selfish, but it was born from the trauma that she did not handle, you know, all the shit that right. came before my dad's death that she wasn't looking at. And then my dad's death and then everything that came after uh, and all, all the reasons that she was trying to keep her portrait of what she thought her life was together. And then my sister and I were just kind of glue for that, you know? And part, do you, do you believe that part of why she would encourage that was because she was having a hard enough time caring for herself. She couldn't add you to the care for mix. Oh, like, no. Like, does somebody no. else care for her? No, <laughs> no. Cause then, then it was a, um, then it was a pattern of what well, you, you can't move out and live on your own. Your sister just moved out. You can't leave me, you know, and wanting my husband and I to live with her and, and then even with her new husband, like it was just a lot, it was, it was grasping and grappling for anything that could make sense Man. of, I think that's the a life lot of therapy. She, yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Thank you. I feel so seen. <laughs> oh my um, gosh. And, and I love her so much. We're currently very, very estranged. Um, and I love her oh, so much. I'm and so can sorry. See, thank you. Um, and I can see uh, so many things, um, you know, like that, where it's just like, oh, fuck, that, that was hard. Can see why you did it, but fuck, you know. And really the, the terms of our reconnection is she go to therapy. Any, any kind of therapy, uh, get help with her toxic traits and the things that she's in denial around. And, and right now she's, you know, she's, that's too hard. 
and she's choosing to uh, live her version of her happiest life and not look at that. And that's, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of things around, um, around my being brought up and really recognizing how important, how prioritized societal norms. And it, despite my mom being like super cool and being like, yeah, you can be gay, like all the things, how prioritized the male gaze and societal norms and heteronormativity, those roles, how yeah. prioritized they were. And then I found these men, they loved me. And I was like, oh, that feels nice. Yeah. And then, and then would form an emotional connection and then would just make it work because I said I would, uh, yeah. even after the, the relationship should have progressed, ended, whatever. Um, even in my 11 year relationship, and he and I came to terms with this was that relationship probably should have ended at about the five and a half, six year mark. Uh, but fucking made it work. And we were both fiercely codependent together. So we had just ended up being best friends and roommates at the end. Uh, but it's, that's really, so it was almost this like accidental pushing away of my sexuality because of all the commitments that I refused mm -hmm. to put down, you know, all of the, the things that felt great that I chased and then just held way too tight to. Wow. And, you know, when you hit the nail on that society tells us that I recently read and then had the privilege of interviewing on my other podcast, was it chance Olga dies dreaming by Suchil Gonzalez. And there is mm -hmm. a line I don't know if any of you have read it. It's really good. If you like fiction, it follows a brother and a sister from Brooklyn who are Puerto Rican and of Puerto Rican descent. And the brother is closeted for good majority of, of the book. It, but he's like, no one ever explicitly told me this was bad. Mm -hmm. They just always told me that girls were good. Right. That the girls should like me and that I should like the girls. And, oh, where are you going to bring home a nice girl? Like, no one ever would have hated me. I just did the thing that I could clearly see that they thought was good. Yeah. Yeah. And there was also this uh, this power attached to uh, obtaining that heteronormative situation. Uh, it, it was almost like I was raised to believe that my power lied in my femininity only by mm. way of how it inter interacted with masculinity. Damn. And it was like, well, fuck, I guess I can be good at that. <laughs> and now that that isn't your narrative, mm -hmm. do you feel more powerful? Uh, infinitely, infinitely. Yeah. And I even see all the moments where I thought I felt powerful in the past having to do with how, how I was interacting with, uh, a man wanting me and people pleasing like, and codependency. I'm like, Oh babe, you, this is literally you at your weakest and you felt so powerful. Wow. That's a perspective right there. Since we have blown my time limit <laughs> out the water, which I knew we were going to do <laughs> listeners. I try to keep these conversations to about 40 minutes because I know that you're like, you know, we you have got TikTok to do. attention spans, right? <laughs> I know, but we've just gone there. So I'm going to open a door that the, they are not expecting <laughs> um, because I feel like we should just go all the way there. Uh, you had a really, I think, close relationship with your father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, extremely close. I was definitely, if you would use the cringy term, like daddy's girl. Daddy's girl. Yeah. yeah. Um, your father's death was really traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. It was. And, and again, and not to sound callous, uh, losing someone is always traumatic. Absolutely. It, yeah. It was even more so more than just losing him and that being stripped away. Um, especially at 16 when I was really leaning on that relationship because I was, you know, I was at the age where I was discovering a lot of different types of men and was scared that the idyllic version of a man that I was raised with, my father, was incredibly romantic, incredibly respectful, all these things, uh, that that wasn't real. 
Like, why am I going to find that? Are you the only one that exists? And just energetically really, like really tightening up on that relationship with him. And what was so impactful about it was the way that he died was in his report and his police report uh, was labeled as autoerotic asphyxiation. And at 16, uh, and I had not become sexually active. I mean, I was like super good at making out or whatever, but like I had not become (laughs) (laughs) actually sexually active. And for that world to bust through the doors of my 16 year old world before I had experienced my own sensuality or sexuality at all, it was shocking. Uh, It was traumatizing. It was so confusing. Uh, Oh my God. Yeah. I didn't. Uh, and also just what society was telling me about it was so confusing because even at 16, I was like, oh, he fucked up. Like I wasn't right. mad at him. I was just like, That's right. Fucking it's a bad mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Like, damn, dude. Um, but I wasn't angry uh, and I wasn't disgusted. Um, I didn't even know what fetishes were, you know, or kinks or anything like that. So I didn't I didn't have any. Uh, strong feelings like that, but society was telling me I should, you know, society was like, well, don't say how he died out loud. You know, that's, uh, I'm maybe they got it wrong. That's your father wouldn't do something like that, you know? And it was just like, what? Like it. And then it was just, uh, it was criminalized. It was, I mean, as ironic as it is to say this, it was hypersexualized. Yeah, uh, of course. It was so many things. And I absorbed that message of, if you trust your desire, you'll die. And Damn. I didn't recognize that until I was fuck, like 34, 35. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the narrative that's been playing in my head my whole life, um, which ironically, right before I came screaming out of the closet. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was this. That's just a. It, it's a devastating message to absorb at that age that and at it, any it painted, age but yes yeah if you, and it if painted you chase everything. your desires you will die yeah and it painted everything i was to learn about my sexuality after that and about sex itself and about people and just everything sure. yeah was he alone yes yeah he was a long-haul truck driver and so they found him in the cab of his truck somewhere in oklahoma wow yeah. And I and while we have judged your mother in this conversation and as a mother with children, her choosing to let you go away versus dealing with her shit makes me mad. Mm-hmm. I, ca- I can't imagine that being my spouse. Right. Yeah. All the things that that uh, I have a, a very clear right to be angry about in the trauma that I've endured and and, and anything in my family. Um, and her, you know, directly from her choices, there is that, uh, you know, empathic balance of yeah. she has a lot of shit to work out because she's had a lot of shit she's gone through, yeah. you know. And of course, I hope she chooses to work through it while she's in alive and yeah. can be in my life, you know, but Me it's, too. you know, Yeah. Oh, I just want to come through and give you a big hug. Oh, right uh, but <laughs> you. You mentioned imp- being an empath. And one of the things mm-hmm. that you say in your book is that while you would never say that all empaths are people pleasers, all people pleasers are inherently empaths. Yes. And that is that is being said from the full on believing every sense of it energetic spectrum and even if you're just using it as a bullshit excuse you know uh Mm -hmm. allowing yourself to be impacted by what you're perceiving is someone else's energy or uh, if you are very sensitive to someone else's energy and you're allowing yourself to be impacted by that but either way yeah it's fascinating to me one of the things i really appreciated about your book and the time we've spent together 
is this idea that by people pleasing, we are robbing other people of their own autonomy, of their ability to say yes or no, to tell you what you want, what they want, what they don't want. You alluded to that earlier in the conversation, like you're setting yourself on fire for people and we don't know if they're cold. Yeah. Right. Yep. I have some really amazing friends through the podcasting industry. They're coaches. They're fabulous folks. And, and one of them, I'm going to give Leah Carey from Good Girls Talk About Sex. I'm going to specifically call you out, Leah, in all the wonder, most wonderful ways. Because when I have things that I want to talk about and I share it with Leah, Leah says to me, would you like me to listen or would you like me to give you my thoughts? That's so and nice. every time I say, <laughs> oh, I think I would like your thoughts or, or I just kind of want to bitch about it. it was, what a gift that is to yeah. not assume, you know, the answer for what somebody wants, but just to ask it. And I try to emulate that. So thank you, Leah. But to me, that's that what, that's what you're talking about is this notion that we just shouldn't assume we're not helping anybody by deciding for them that they're going to like us or not like us or want this or not want this or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, robbing people the organic ability to see you and choose if they want to love you. That's mm. that's the kind of love that you really want from anyone. Yeah. Right. And it's also all you. I hope anyone out there, that's all you really want for someone is to feel that kind of love that kind of genuine love for someone you don't, if, if you're like, if you're thinking about your daughter, you don't ever want for her to feel like she has to love someone because they've made themselves inherently no lovable on paper. Yeah. Like, no well, way. they do, they do so much for me. So I should love them. Like, bleh, you know, but we, Absolutely. it's, it's that's the power, right? That's the power of allowing your own survival mechanisms and your control to convince you that you have to curate everything for everyone or else you're not lovable. Well, that's it's such a deep seated fear that if if we do show them our true selves, if we do push back or if we don't bend over backwards for people, they couldn't possibly love us. But the opposite end of that spectrum is how can they love us if they don't know us? And exactly. You have to say, is it worth the risk? Yeah. This cardboard cutout that you make of yourself, you're like, they'll love this. It's like, what if they don't want to love cardboard? What if they mm. would have like just adored you and you're just shoving this cardboard on them? And neither one of you are happy and neither one of you can be fully expressed. And that's robbing. That's so robbing. So much of that comes down to perspective, not making assumptions, seeing other people's mm -hmm. perspective, which brings me back to your dad. Uh, one of my yeah. favorite stories in your book, early, very early in the book, it's become your logo. I think you have a tattoo of it, of mm -hmm. uh, the perception cubes. Would you share that story with everyone? Because th this, I see this like a movie reel in my head. That that part <laughs> of your book over and over again, and I and I love it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it would be these moments when I was about eight years old, and I would be just storming through the house, pitching an absolute fit, screaming at my sister. And my dad would grab me by the arm and like set me down in a chair at the table. I'd be like, what the hell's going on? Calm down. And I'd say, I can't. Train has been such a bitch. You know, <laughs> just be just whatever. Uh, and he would grab the nearest uh, piece of paper and a pen and he would slap them down on the table in front of me and he would say, do it or draw it. And I would pout and I would grab the pen and I would protest only in body language. Like, this is so stupid. And I would start to doodle these little 3D cubes that he had shown uh, my sister and I how to draw. And, you know, there's those little cubes where you draw a square and you draw another square slightly off and then you connect it with lines. And then if you shift your eyes, it can be facing one way or the other. And he would have me just continually draw them over and over and over on this piece of paper until I was physically calmed down enough to have an actual conversation. And he would say, uh, why do we do this? And I would still be an asshole and I'd be like, to calm down or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> 
And uh, he was always so patient, so patient. And uh, he would say, stop it. Why do we do this? And uh, then I would get into my listening energy, you know, adopt the listening pose where you look up with your big eight-year-old eyes. And you're like, mm. okay, I'm allowing you to speak to me now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and my dad would point to the cubes and he would say, which square is on top? And uh, I knew I was playing the game, but I would do it anyway. And I would say this one. And I would point to whatever super obvious cube because I had drawn it. So like I would know. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and then he would say, but what if it isn't? And then I would sit and I would listen and he would say, it doesn't make your sister wrong that she doesn't agree with you. And it doesn't make you wrong that you didn't change your mind to agree with her, but it makes you absolutely wrong for telling her she's wrong for not agreeing with you. And then he would pat me on the head and tell me to go apologize for, you know, acting like a dictator. <laughs> How often do you do that now? I mean, whether or not you actually draw the cubes, maybe you do, or but just remind yourself of, that there are there are lots of truths and your truth isn't the only truth. Yeah. Um, I, and there are still, cause I think it's so important to really allow your brat to speak. Right. Allow yeah, her to speak of course. first. Yeah, yeah. 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 Just like, just like, uh, you know, just like a child, allow them to lose their fucking mind and then be like, okay, now will you tell me why you think the sky is falling? Uh, and, and that's so important is that we don't get that. We don't shame ourselves uh, for not expressing rage, but <laughs> absolutely express uh, the rage, express the rage. And then maybe like talk yourself out of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but then there's, there's always this moment. Um, I don't doodle them anymore. I do whenever I'm doodling, if I'm on a customer service call and I'm just like on hold for forever, always just always doodling them. Um, but it's, it's just a, a, a mental shift now of being like, okay, and sometimes it comes out in this, like, if I don't try to see the other side of this or the potential several other sides of this, how big of an asshole am I going to feel? Mm. <laughs> like, sometimes it comes from that place of just trying to save my own ass. Uh, and then sometimes, because I uh, sometimes have to look to myself selfishly if empathy isn't available in that moment, right? Um, yes. I, I do this a lot in regards to my mom, because there's still so much anger there that, you know, you know, that daily anger of like today, I didn't get a message from her saying, Hey, I've been at therapy today is another day. She didn't pick me. Yeah. Right. There's still so much anger there. So I tend to have to lean toward myself of like, okay, but are you going to feel like a complete asshole? If there was a perspective you didn't think of rather than other situations where the empathy is there. And it's easy uh, when I look at my partner and I want to be pissed about something or I want to just, you know, be selfish for a minute. And then I'm like, oh, but I have actual empathy in that moment, you know. Uh, so depending on how I get to it there, it's there. Like there's this voice that's like perspective. <laughs> you know, it's there. Yeah. You know, there's so many. Um, and it's and it's probably so ingrained uh, because of that lesson. Uh, and also because my whole life, it's been so important, especially in the last, uh, in the last 10 years, I guess, but it's been so important for me to help people find perspectives that speak to them. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do to take something that I know makes sense in the, this set of words, get to know someone and then figure out what set of words is going to make it click for them. Mm. So yeah, that's lovely. Thank you for sharing it. Thanks. I had no intention of asking this question, but it keeps coming to me. So I'm going to mm -hmm. listen. What would you say to your dad? If you could have one conversation, what would you say? Hmm. Uh, Honestly, I think I would, I would tell him that as much as society 
wanted to make him feel like the people that he chose in his life were what he had to act for and mold his life around that it wasn't true. Uh, and that his life was his own. And that I wish he would have gotten the help that he needed. Um, and saying this, uh, not help around um, his particular kinks, uh, but there's a lot more to the story around him sure. that I discovered even later in life. Um, uh, just a lot of hidden demons and a lot of acts. Uh, and But that's all for the memoir. Uh, I know, right? What's the <laughs> right? next book coming out? Uh, um, but I would have told him that uh, that nobody mattered except for him and that he needed to go find the help so that he could actually have a life that he loved and he was proud of. So Audrey, mm -hmm. when I hear you say that, that is what you told yourself. That exact message is what you told yourself to lack yeah. of a better term, save yourself. Yeah. Honestly, uh, and I, I haven't put these two together till just now, but um, I feel like that moment came because I didn't want to have to say the other thing to myself. And the other thing is the last thing I told him at his gravesite. Uh, it was after I um, discovered uh, several very final truths about him. Um, and had to work through a lot, a lot more trauma. Um, and I visited his gravesite and I told him, this is the last time I'll be here. I still love you for the father you were to me. And I told him, but I'm glad that you're dead. Wow. I'm glad that since you couldn't become someone safe, I'm glad that you, even if by accident, removed the chance for you to hurt anyone else. And then that had to have just left the option in my mind of, do I want anyone to say that to me? Mm. Or do I want, what's the other thing? You know, perception. Mm -hmm. Well, not much is final except death. Mm. Right. So, uh, I, from where I sit, part of not being a people pleaser means you reserve the right to change your mind. All the damn time. Mm. Damn, girl. <laughs> Woo! All right. <laughs> um, what a what a fantastic. Thank you so much for your honesty and candidness and Absolutely. willingness. Um, lots and lots and lots for people to unpack and think about and sit with. Um, but I believe that having those types of awareness is worth celebrating. And Absolutely. you've had a lot of hardship, but also a lot of amazing, wonderful things, including your partner and your book or your fiance, right? You're engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Congrats. Thanks. Um, all, all of the things, how do you like to celebrate? I that's, so funny. I love celebrating. I love moments where I am just luxurious and ridiculous. And I just have like all the champagne and we go somewhere and we dress fancy and I surround myself with only people uh, in whatever current season in my life and in their life are able to fully see me and fully celebrate me, um, which that fluctuates throughout our entire life, right? Yeah. Yeah. The same person that could celebrate you last year probably might not be able to celebrate you this year, just yeah. whatever's going on. Um, but then there's some times where, and I think it's, I think it's the artist thing. There's some times where I am flooded and I don't know how to celebrate. I don't know if I should. And I'm almost kind of numb around whatever is happening, you know? Uh, it happened with the release of my book. It was like launch day and everyone's like, oh my God, how do you want to celebrate? And I was like, uh, I just want to pretend I didn't release a book today. <laughs> I just, and I get really around it. And that's when 
my fiance has this gift of asking the most perfect questions, you know, those questions that make you feel like everything is safe to say. It's safe to not celebrate. It's safe to ask for celebration uh, without asking, what do you want to do? You know, they'll yeah. it, they'll be like, what are you feeling inside your heart? What are you feeling in your body? What is little you want? You know, and. And that in and of itself is a form of celebration. Yeah. It's celebrating yeah. the truth. Yeah. So I think for me, like the, the constant in all of it is I love to celebrate by just having at least one person that really sees me mm. and can help me mine me in that moment. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. For those folks who are listening, they're like, uh, yeah, that's me. I want to stop being a people pleaser. Like I hear myself in so many of these things. Audrey, what would you tell them is the first step? What can they do Mm. first? I think the very, the very first step, once you're already like, ew, I don't want to do this anymore. The first step is wrapping yourself up in so much compassion and honesty and those two things are hard to wrap up in the same blanket yeah because honesty especially for a pleaser is normally weighed down in criticism self-criticism it's like our version of honesty is like well i'm a piece of shit (laughs) like case closed yeah Uh, but just just compassionate honesty that compassionate honesty that lets you wrap up, be warm, be a safe place for yourself and be able to say, okay, maybe I haven't done this right. It's okay that I haven't. It's okay. It's okay. I'm not alone. And it's safe for me to want to change my mind about how Mm. I do this, about how I do life or this relationship or whatever it is. Awareness without judgment. Yeah. I'm a big fan of of Kristen Neff's self-compassion work. Yeah. Powerful shit. I've, I actually have a, a incredible, someone that's changed my life around journaling work and self-compassion and reparenting all the incredible things. Uh, Her name is Glinda Strom and she is at empathy story on Instagram and just life changing for self-compassion work as well. Thank you. I will check her out. We'll put, we'll link to that in the show notes as well. Um, How can people find you if they want? So you're not coaching. Let's just be really clear. Let's go back. (laughs) Audrey does not coach on this. So if you're listening and you're like, I want to fucking work with this badass woman, you can't because Audrey's not coaching. (laughs) But why might they want to connect and follow you, Audrey? Yeah. Um, So now (laughs) instead of coaching, now I just like just open my mouth and give that the wisdom for free. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> do it through my art and do it through all the things. So Audrey.com is a great place. Wait, but how do you spell it? Me. Oh yeah. It is A H D R I. And uh, everyone's like, Oh my God, you got the website of just your first name. That's crazy. I bought it when I was 15. I did not fuck around. <laughs> wow. That is impressive. Like, that is the difference in your generation and mine, because I didn't even have email until I was in college. So it was like, and it was too- DOS based. <laughs> so- Right. Hey, I used to have to do the backslash DOS to play my favorite games. I get it. Um, it was 2000 and I was like, what's the internet? I don't know, but I should buy that. So uh, it is Brilliant. just audrey.com, A-H-E-R-I. And you can also find it, if you forget how to spell it, the whimsicalrebel.com will take you to the same place. And you're and on Instagram, the real Audrey. I, um, yes, at yeah. the real Audrey. Uh, there's also a Patreon uh, where I get to share just all kinds of inner inner workings and like the studio time that we're doing right now for the music behind the audiobook all kinds of things so are you there's on tiktok tons of places. Uh, i i am there's a couple there's a couple out there i've done uh it's just it's they take so long to do <laughs> they do what's your what's your username on tiktok uh i'm pretty sure it's the real audrey okay just for fun you know <laughs> it's my new favorite place to hang out so 
Uh, we'll double check that and we'll make sure we link it in the show notes. Yeah. I love to ask this question and I'm really excited to hear your answer to yeah. it. What is your favorite charitable organization to support? Yeah. So I have, I guess if I have to think about a name, um, one in particular is the NBJC. Do I have those letters in the right order? Uh, National Black Justice Coalition. Okay. But also, I I had so love, I'm so obsessed with being able to be at like an equal opportunity money machine anywhere I go. Uh, if anyone is like, hey, here's this thing I'm trying to raise money for. If there's someone on the street, if there's someone uh, doing an art auction that's benefiting some other thing, anything Pitbull related, like I, I just, I think one of my favorite charities is just having this massively open heart yeah, and just being like, yeah, yeah. How much do you need? You know, yeah. and being able to, uh, yeah, to give to, I like trickling. I like just trickling it everywhere. I love that. As much as I can. Yeah. I, it's really important to me. And I believe that when we share our favorite charitable organizations or the things that we want to put passion and compassion into, we inspire one another uh, to show up. Absolutely. More often, more authentically. So thank you for that. Audrey, yeah. will you share your three words with us one last time? Absolutely. Activated, visceral, whimsical. They're great words. They're words <laughs> I don't think we've ever had in over right. 200 episodes. Um, <laughs> can you quickly tell us why you picked them? What do they mean to you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, activated uh, is for everything in my life and how I've, I've realized that I have gone through life. Um, almost like a, a toddler just with blinders on in a room full of pointy desks, just like, ah! uh, just activated. If I have this idea of something I'm passionate about, it will be happening very quickly. Um, and even too quick for me some of the time. <laughs> uh -huh. So, uh, yeah. Um, and even when I was younger, I was kind of shamed into believing that that was a bad thing. Like mm. if I talked about something, it would make people worry when I talked about something excitedly. Cause they're like, ah, oh, shit, now she's going to go do it. You know? <laughs> like if I, if I was that kid that was like, I'm going to move to Paris. They were like, oh God, like let's have it. Yeah. Actual but now it's inspiring. Like, oh, let's hear it. Cause Audrey's going to do it. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like I love uh, that person. <laughs> yeah. Just in November, uh, my fiance was like, Hey, let's get an RV and do the RV life for a while. I was like, done. And within two weeks, we were. There you go. You know, and it's so activation is. Uh, and I was doing um, it's some sort of corporate personality test. And one of my descriptive top three words was I think the first one was activator. I was like, oh, that that makes sense. There and my go. partner is strategist. Thank God, because if we were both. <laughs> Good, good compromises there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Strategy, not my suit. Um, so yeah. So activation activated is, I love living life that way. Visceral uh, because it seems that no matter what kind of conversation or what kind of thing I want to share or how simple a question is that someone asks me, there is a visceral response mm. because, and I'm not sure if it's because I can't not be honest and way too forthcoming with information uh, <laughs> or, you know, I don't know what it is, but there always seems to be this. There's always my little pleaser inside of me has this knee jerk reaction of wanting to be like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, you probably didn't want that much information, mm. you know? Uh, and I've trained myself to not say uh, that. to the best of my ability to <laughs> not do that and and let people learn you know if you ask a question maybe you're not used to being around incredibly viscerally honest people <laughs> but if you ask a question be prepared to get the answer you get you know like when yeah. you ask a question about my dad uh having that kind of response so that's definitely visceral uh and whimsical because i love little me <laughs> Yeah. Little me is so cool. And uh, she's never left me of all the times I've left her. Uh, she's like, oh, that's I'm beautiful. such a sucker for Christmas. I'm such a sucker for Disney World. Like I just, yeah. If you can put whimsy into anything, it makes it better. I love that. 
I love that. And I adore you. And I'm so grateful. Uh, we just went all in. I knew it too, right? When I said to the beginning, I was like, so I try to keep these conversations to 40 minutes. Why do I think that's not going to work? We've doubled it. So for those of you that are still here with us, thank you. Thank you. I, it was worth it. See, aren't you glad you stuck around? Audrey, thank you so much for being here, for being with us. Um, I look forward to some opportunities to to collaborate and do cool things yeah. together. That would be yeah. fantastic. All right. Good deal. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, folks. That was amazing, right? It was a lot. And I would love to hear what resonated with you most or all of the things that resonated. As always, I invite you to connect with me. The easiest way to do that is to follow me on Instagram, the show on Instagram. We are the Brave Files podcast, and you can send me a DM. I promise I will respond. You can also email me, heather at vickeryandco.com to let me know your thoughts, how you're planning to go out and choose bravely, or maybe what people-pleasing traits you're ready to ditch. I love connecting with you. You, my wonderful listener, are the reason I do this work, and it is hard work, although today was a lot of fun. Fun and hard are not always different. Thank you so much for being here with us, sending you so much love. This is Heather Vickery reminding you today and every single day to go out and choose bravely. Talk to you next week. Bye. Hey, friends, I want to share something really exciting with you. We already know you enjoy listening to podcasts because you're listening to this one, but I'm also betting you enjoy audiobooks. And hey, listen, if you don't already enjoy audiobooks, then it's time to check them out. That's why I'm really excited to share Libro.fm with you. They are an incredible new platform for listening to audiobooks. And by choosing Libro.fm over other audiobook services, you are supporting a local bookstore of your choice and investing in your local community. Libro.fm offers over 150,000 audiobooks via their primary platform, which, by the way, they built with love and from scratch because they're a small business also. They even offer bookseller recommendations for great audiobook options. You can sign up right now via www.vickeryandco.com slash LibroFM. That's vickeryandco.com slash L-I-B-R-O-F-M. And when you do, you'll get one free audiobook of your choice and the proceeds will go to your favorite local bookstore. Now, check what I just said there. You're going to get a free book and the proceeds are still going to go to your local bookstore because Libro.fm makes sure that their booksellers get paid even when they give a promo to customers. I've listened to over 20 audiobooks this year alone. I especially love listening to memoirs read by the author, and it feels great knowing that all of my purchases support my local bookstore, The Book Table, in Oak Park, Illinois. Libro.fm. The same audiobooks, the same price, but a completely different story. Check them out right now at vickeryandco.com slash Libro.fm. Have you ever thought about starting a podcast? Maybe you've had this thought and then quickly shut it down because who has the time? Or you don't know how, or gosh, it just all seems too hard. If you have something to share with the world, we want to encourage you to get your message out. The world needs to hear it. Did you know that 50% of all homes are podcast fans? If you've ever wondered about having your own podcast or how it can increase your business or get your message across, then please join me and the other experts from the Podcast Power Academy for our monthly free Q&A session. It's called, So You Want to Start a Podcast? This casual live conversation will help you understand how podcasting can be a great decision, why now is the best time to get started, and how to get into action with it. Visit podcastpoweracademy.com to learn more. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories of people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes and full episode transcripts, or to get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we would love to know what you think of the show. 
you can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery and Co-Success Coaching, coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music was created and produced in a custom collaboration with Matt Lewis from ML Creative Consulting, a boutique firm dedicated to helping clients identify their unique sound and amplify their brand with custom delivered soundtracks. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to everyone on Team Brave from our producers, associate producers, copy editors, writers, and support team. Special thanks to Molly, Mary, Kim, Sabra, and Sabrina. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.